Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, once again, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we gather in the Word. Gather in the Word. Because the wonderful Word. The wonderful Word. <laughs> The blessed word. Hallelujah. The word that has the power to change us. Yes. The tool that God the Father uses to mold us and shape us as he is conforming us into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. So there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're continuing on in our study. And this today actually may really be, honestly be, the last part of our study in First Timothy. Uh, I said that last week, and I may have said it the week before yeah. that. We and you might see. be saying it next week. <laughs> but as the Spirit leads, yes. praise God, and however yes. He leads, I'll be filled with joy about it. So we're going to continue on. We left off last week, uh, like in the, in the 19th oh, verse of 19th. chapter 6 of mm -hmm. Timothy. And we're going to pick it up around there again, right after Mark asks God's blessing on our time together. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the word yes. and for the work of the cross. And Lord, just wherever you want to go with this Bible study, just mm -hmm. put it in our brains and our hearts to speak it out for your edification and for our good, just our spiritual good. And just pull it out and put it in our hearts. Amen. 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 Yes, Lord. And Father, I pray that I don't say anything that you haven't put on my heart. Amen. Nothing comes out of my mouth that you haven't put in my heart. Put a guard over our mouth. Put a guard over my mouth. So, yeah, actually, uh, we were, let me turn to where we left off. I, First Timothy. First Timothy. We we're talking about yes. life and deed. Can you look and see where that is? I'm sorry. I didn't hear what you said. Life and deed. Verse, life. Is it in verse 19? <clears throat> yes. It is. Yes. That's exactly what I thought. Because that's what we were talking about as we ended last week. And I said at the time that I really felt that, I, that there was more that the Lord wanted me to speak about that. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to pick up in verse 19. But I, I just want to say this before we do that. You may be familiar with this fellow. He's a very, very famous American writer, Henry David Thoreau. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He lived in the early to mid 1800s. And he is famous for a number of his works. Probably the most famous was a book called Walden, oh. which was centered around Walden Pond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in that, he made this statement, which has had a great impact on a lot of people. The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Mm -hmm. Well, that was Thoreau that said that. <clears throat> and he was insightful, but I, I believe he missed the mark, perhaps, not understanding the great truth. And the great truth is that most people don't ever live life at all. Mm, this is true. Because just walking on the planet is not necessarily living life. We're existing. You know, Paul talks and he talks about the fact that when we were, before we were saved, before we accepted life, Jesus Christ, into our, our as the gift of the Father, we were the walking dead. Mm -hmm. Since we were dead walking in our transgressions, we weren't living. No. The act of breathing is not life. All right? Without Jesus Christ in you, you have no it's life within you. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. All right? Mm -hmm. Jesus is life, and life is not about what you have, but about the God you serve and what you actually are. And what you actually are is if you have received that gift of life, you're a child of God. That is the single most important thing, and I think we talked about that last mm -hmm. week. There is no better confession to make than to say that I am a child of God. Because that heaven is a family affair. You don't get in because you went to church enough times. You don't get in because you put enough money in the basket. You don't get in because you participated in building a building. You get in because you're part of the family. So being a child of God is that confession, that great confession. The world we live in is becoming obsessed, and we, this is what we were talking about when we ended last week, mm -hmm. obsessed with virtual reality. Right. right. Okay? Mm -hmm. Everywhere. It's surrounding us everywhere, and it is growing by leaps and bounds. 
And I'm going to tell you something. Artificial intelligence is not intelligence at all. No. It, it may be artificial knowledge and to be, be able to compute that knowledge. But without the spirit of God, without God's breath in your life, you're not alive. Okay. The reason that they're becoming obsessed with it is because it allows people to escape reality. Mm hmm. Okay, why do you think so many people spend time in virtual games on the, in the movies? They're escaping reality. That's right. That's and right. they're buying into virtual reality. Virtual reality provides an experience without the reality. Mm -hmm. Okay? Without the dangers. Without the reality. Yeah, I mean, yes. Yeah. And yes, is there a danger? Well, there, there's danger in the sense that our flesh can die. There's, you know, there's death to the natural man. But the fact is, Jesus' promise is that if we believe in him, even if we die, yet shall we live, all right? So he has taken that away, and that becomes part of the reality of our lives. Right. A virtual church, and there's virtual reality. Trust me, there is such a thing as a virtual church. It is image without the substance. It's about people who are gathered together as a crowd rather than as a family. It's about people gathering more focused on their church than on their God. It's about praise music that is more focused on the singers and the music than on the one that they are singing about. Virtual reality is about preaching that is more focused on pleasing the people than on pleasing the Lord. Mm -hmm. Virtual reality is about people who are focused on pleasure, having lost sight of the word of the cross. It is the enemy saying that he will make himself like the Most High God. That's what virtual reality is. The church, quote, and I'm putting big quotes around that, in Laodicea, the church that is in the, that God speaks of in Revelation chapter, he doesn't just speak of, he speaks to. He's writing a letter to the church at Laodicea. And that provide church, and I'm, like I said, I'm using that word judiciously um, because it provides a church-like experience without the reality of being the church. The book of Acts provides a light, sheds a light on what church, the, the church, let me start by saying what the church looked like mm -hmm. in, the, in the beginning, the reality of the church in Acts chapter 2. It says, speaking of the early believers, the church, they were continually, continually, not once a week, not a few times a year. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. That's Acts 2.42. That's what the church is supposed to look like, right? However, in the church pictured before the great and terrible day of the Lord, the last church it's pictured, the church of Laodicea, mm -hmm. it talks about the gathering. But people cannot be gathered in his name at that church because Jesus is outside and not in their midst. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, Jesus said, I am there in their midst. Matthew 18, 20. If they were gathered in his name, Jesus would be inside, not standing outside at the door. Do they have praise? Oh, I'm sure they got some praise going on. But the people who are singing and rejoicing that they are rich and have need of nothing are blind to the truth that Jesus is not even in the house. Jesus is outside because the Lord God inhabits, he dwells in the praises of his people as it is written in Psalm 22, verse 3. If he inhabits the praise of his people and he's not even in the building, he's outside. Well, then it's not praises to him that's being mm -hmm. sung, mm -hmm. right? The preaching, while the people may be, listen, this is important. While the people may be uplifted, they may be encouraged, and they may be pleased by the message that's being preached inside that church. Makes them feel good. It cannot be the rightly divided word of truth mm -hmm. because Jesus, who is the word of God, is standing outside. He's not in the building. And it says in 2 Timothy, Paul will write to 2 Timothy later, and he says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, 
and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Second Timothy 4, 3 and 4. You know, Alice and I were having our little personal Bible study this morning, and I was reading from Jeremiah. I was just going to. Oh, yeah. Yes. In uh, Jeremiah, we were in Jeremiah uh, 14. Now, I'll just read this to you. This is the, the prophet, that wailing prophet, who the, to whom the word of God was his joy and delight. He said, but ah, Lord God, I said, look, the prophets are telling them you will not see the sword, nor will you have famine but I will give you lasting peace in this place. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I have neither sent them nor commanded them nor spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and a deception of their own minds. Now that's not just Old Testament stuff. Remember that in the New Testament, among many places, Jesus warned against, Peter warned against, Paul warned against, James warns against, John warned against the false prophets that would come, particularly in the last days. When, when John said, test the spirits for many false prophets have gone abroad. You need to be on guard. Remember that, okay? That was Jeremiah. 14, and I read uh, verses 13 and 14. Okay, and then... What was common in the early church? Not just common. What was the habitual practice of the early church? Going day by day from house to house, the breaking of bread. Yes. If the preaching becomes devoid of the hard truth, if the preaching becomes devoid of the word of the cross and the cost of following Jesus, then the commemoration of that truth, our communion, the Lord's table will certainly not reflect the glory of the one who now stands outside. A lot of churches, you know, have communion once a year or once. A, you know, the early church did it day by day. You know why? Because they were celebrating. They were commemorating. And, and Paul said to the Corinthians, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.18. That's the power of God. Oh, a lot of these churches, they have pretty things, they have pretty buildings, they have pretty sermons, they have pretty music. Do they have the true power of God unto salvation? If Jesus is absent, standing apart from that church of Laodicea, and they're not even aware of that. That's virtual reality, not reality. They're all going to walk out the door on that day and say, what, a, oh, what great services we had. Mm -hmm. But they haven't, they haven't had any relationship with God, okay? You, you've got to consider this. You've got to test this. You've got to examine all things and hold fast that which is good. It's not just a matter that you like what was said. I'm going to tell you something. When the power of God is moving, that may be the time, the most time, that you won't like at all mm -hmm. what the, what's being said. At least your flesh won't yeah. like it. Right. But your spirit will rejoice to hear the truth. Amen. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to verses 20 and 21. O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and, and the opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and then gone astray from the faith. Grace be with you. Guard what has been entrusted to you. You know, let me just say this first of all. If God gives you anything, if he entrusts you with anything, you then become responsible for it. Mm -hmm. From whom much is given, much is required. Yes. God gives you a gift. God gives you a talent. God gives you something to be used in the church. You are responsible to use it. Mm -hmm. You are accountable to use it. And, and there will be, there will be an accounting. Okay. Remember that just a few verses before what we're at, where we're at right now, mm -hmm. that Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, fight the good fight of faith in verse 12. Yes. I mean, it's just a little bit before where we are. Mm -hmm. Fight the good fight of faith. This is the fight. So we had better heed what Paul wrote to the believers in Ephesus. Now, remember, Ephesus is where he had left Timothy to oversee that church. Yes. I mean, think there's a great connection here between the two. Mm -hmm. So he's telling Timothy to guard what's been entrusted. Okay. 
Think about what then Paul had spoken or does speak to the church at Ephesus. And obviously what he's saying to the church at Ephesus, God is saying to us. Right. Ephesians 6, 13, 17, and I'm sure you know this. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with the truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the, fi the, uh, of the evil one, mm -hmm. and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. God, anything that God calls you to, he equips you for. He's not the Pharaoh of Egypt that calls you to a task and then doesn't give you what you need. He's not going to ask you to make bricks without straw. He's also not going to ask you to fight the battle without equipping you for the battle. And here he is doing that with his word. <clears throat> we, need, we need to put on the whole armor of God. We need to understand, it says that we stand firm against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. The enemy is out there, and he has one purpose. He has one desire. He comes to kill, to destroy, to steal. He wants He wants you dead. He wants you living in poverty. Now, I'm not talking about how many dollars you have in the bank. You know, even the church of Laodicea, they're saying, we're rich. We have need of nothing. And they had nothing. You know what they didn't have? They didn't have Jesus. And that's everything. Store up your treasures in heaven. That's where the devil can't get to him. We've done studies on this. As a matter of fact, one of the things that, that I've done that's still in process, mm -hmm. which it has been for a while, <laughs> by the grace of God, someday I'll finish it, is a book that I've written called The Schemes of the Devil and the Triumph of Christ Jesus. We need to understand that we're in a battle. I mean, church has become... If, you're, if your church is just all the time pleasant, if your Christianity is all the time just pleasant, but you know what? It's, it's, probably, vir yeah. it's probably virtual yeah. rather than real. Because the fact of the matter is, go look at the, the faith chapter, Hebrews 11, and see what it's about. It's about warfare. It's about sacrifice. It's about obeying God in the face of challenge. Why would God give us a weapon if we didn't That's right. <clears throat> need it, right? Amen. And you better be conscious of that weapon. You know, I'm faced with that all the time, more and more and more. And I, I'm, I've been, I'm trying to think of the right word, a little bit more. No, I'm just going to tell you. It's like I, Alice and I were going into a government office one day, early in the morning. We were getting ready to go overseas, and I needed to renew a, a visa or something. And we had gotten there a few minutes early, and the place was already crowded. So there was a big line outside the building waiting to get in when the doors opened. And as that was happening, there were two police officers, and they were kind of wandering up and down the line and reminding people that, that you, you know, make sure that you have no weapons and no, I don't know what the other thing was. You're not allowed to take in any weapons into the building. So I called the cop over and I said, listen, I have to, I have to ask you a question. I said, I have a weapon and I can't, I have to bring it in. And he looked at me <laughs> and he said, what are you talking about? And I said, it's the word of God. I said, I carry it all the time and I can't put it down. And, I said, like, and, and he just he just got this great big smile on his right. face. And he called the other cop over. He said, come here, come here. You got to hear this. <laughs> yeah. And that and that caused somebody in the line. Oh, yeah. Heard. And then we wound up because the guy standing behind me in the line got all excited. And, he and told we me, ended up We wound yeah. up witnessing to him. Yeah, it was very cool. You know, and I, I'm... You be led by the Spirit of God and, and be prayerful about this, but I won't put down the sword of the God. I will not put down the sword of God. I will not put down the word of God right. to enter into any place. Yeah. Period. Now, that may sound... Well, you it may can't sound, because it's written on your heart. It's written on my heart. It's written on the it's tablets written, of my heart. Yeah, it's written Amen. on our hearts. We, it goes with us wherever. But, but I'm saying, we need to practice our Christianity. We need to become conscious of God's word and focus in our lives. It's It's... It's true. I'm not joking. I mean, it may sound like kind of a funny thing, and it was a real blessing. But now you walk into any building, and that's when you'll see these signs, because you're so deathly afraid of people having weapons. Yes. As well, the world should be. But I'll tell you this. No no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. prosper. But the weapon I carry 
is life giving. Amen. It's not life taking. Okay. All right. So then the next part of the verse said, avoid worldly and empty chatter. That's a biggie. That's a very biggie. <laughs> because I'd say you hear so much oh worldly, goodness. empty chatter. In the church. Um, well, among believers. Yeah. I'm, I'm serious. And there's so much pressure to do that, to conform to what's going on in the world. Yeah. And that's all it's about. I, I'm not going to get into this now, but I'll tell you what. Put a guard on your mouth. Isn't that what David prayed? Mm -hmm. Yes. David, a man of the God's own heart, he prayed and he said, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Psalm 141.3. We need to do that. We need to guard that. We need to have that attitude. Let nothing come out of my mouth that you haven't put on my heart, O Lord. Amen. This is an age when everybody wants to draw you in to conversations, worldly conversations political conversations, conversations about what's going on out in the world that draws you away from the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Be on guard. James said, and James knew what he was talking about, because this is an inspired Word of God, the God-breathed Word. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the indication inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And James also said just before that, he said, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. James 1.19. You better hear from God before you speak. Jesus did. John chapter 12, he said he didn't speak anything that he had not heard from the Father. So put a guard. These are the perilous last days, and the enemy is hard, hard at work. So you know what? I'm going to finish up to this time. Mm -hmm. But I want to finish with a little bit of a summary, all right? We've, we've spent a, quite a number of weeks. I, my goodness, I think we've spent probably four months yeah. in the study of uh, Paul's first letter to Timothy. So uh, how do you how, summarize all of that in a brief thing? I, I'll just say, you know, there was a, a dear old brother who's now going on to be with the Lord, uh, J. Vernon McGee. Oh, yes. Used to hear. Yes. Just, he was a, a down homey kind of guy and just a, a, a great teacher. And he once said about the letter of Timothy, he said in his studies of the letter of Timothy, he said that that letter from Paul is all about the creed and con uh, the creed and the conduct of the church. Mm. Well, that's, that's that's really a good statement. That's, that's what this letter is about. It's about the belief, the faith and the conduct. I mean, I agree. That's it, it's about faith in our hearts and it's a faith that drives and controls our actions. Because that's what it's supposed to do, right? When you do that, when your actions are driven by what God has spoken to you, by the faith in your heart, that will show the presence of the Lord in our lives and touch the lives around us. Over and over, he instructs Timothy, Paul does, to stand and teach against strange doctrines. Mm. Right? Yes. All through this letter, yes. we've heard that. Yes. Paul will again speak to this in his second letter to Timothy when he writes about the perilous last days, when he says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away from their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Second Timothy four, three and four. When you do that, or when people do that, that coincides with a lifestyle among the people that is certainly not pleasing to the Lord and does not glorify the Lord. Think about what he said in that chapter preceding that in 2 Timothy 3. Men will be, and he's talking about believers or, or so-called church, those members of the virtual church. They'll be lovers of self. They'll be lovers of money. They'll be boastful arrogant, revilers. They'll be disobedient to parents, ungrateful, 
unholy, unloving, irreconcilable. There'll be malicious gossips without any self-control, brutal, haters of good. There'll be treacherous, reckless, conceited. There'll be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, that is virtual reality. That's from all I read was from Second Timothy chapter three. A form of godliness. They denied the power. That's a church based on virtual reality. It lacks God's power. The word of the cross. How can you know the reality from the virtual? How can you know what is truly the body of Christ as opposed to an organized church? How can you know? Like I said, Jesus never calls you anything that he doesn't equip you for. So Jesus said this. He was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31. Oh, you need to abide in the word. Amen. If ever there was a time you need to spend time in the word of God, if ever there was a time that maybe you need to turn off your radio, turn off the television, mate, if ever there was a time, to, now is that time. I'm telling you the truth. You need to be on guard because there is an enemy who is after you. You know that the, the adversary, that enemy, he goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's after you. Now, if you stay in the word, the word who is made flesh and dwelt among us, he will go before you. He will go before, before you. you. He will be go before you, and he will be your rear guard. Yes. This is if the devil, if the devil attacks you, just say, talk to my big brother. That's right. But if your big brother is out someplace else because you've walked away from him, you could be in trouble. That's right. And if you want to know how to win the battle against the devil, it's real, real simple. Humble yourself. Humble yourself before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Amen. I pray that this study in the Word has blessed you. And it's not a matter of, of us, because what are we? It's the Word that has the power. Absolutely. You know, if this is the real body of Christ, it doesn't depend on how cute we are, how pretty we are, how nice we speak. It doesn't depend on the building we're in. It depends on the mighty God that we serve yes. and the spirit that dwells within us. Do not do anything in these perilous last days except cling to God. Hallelujah. Cling to him. Hold fast. Hold fast. Mm. So, Father, I just praise you and thank you. That you allow us to come together, that you, in these days, Lord, that we can gather in your name. And this is indeed a gathering in your name. That we can proclaim how wonderful you are, how great you are. That we might walk in the fear of God, the awesome power that you have, Lord God. Lord, I just pray that everything that we do in our lives will be led by our creed, by our faith by the words that you have spoken to us and we have treasured in our heart. And I pray that the actions of our life, the behavior of our life, would reflect and reveal that faith in all that we do for your glory, for your glory, that we might be faithful to bring the knowledge of you into every place that we go. Well, we just praise you and thank you. Yes, we and until next week, when we'll probably start the second letter of Timothy. God Amen. bless you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.